<laughs> this morning, uh, this sermon I'm going to preach this afternoon on the building the temple of God. Text comes from 1 Kings chapter 6, verses 1 and 11 through verse 14. And it came to pass in the 480th year after the children of Israel were come out of the land of Egypt. 480 years. Man. In the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the month of Ziph, which is the second month, that he began to build the house of the Lord. And look down at verse 11 through 14. And the word of the Lord came to Solomon, saying, Concerning this house which thou art in building, if thou wilt walk in my statutes and execute, execute my judgments and keep all of my commandments to walk in them, then will I perform my word with thee, which I spake unto David thy father, and I will dwell among the children of Israel, will not forsake my people Israel. So Solomon built the house and finished it. Now, it's interesting. You get God appeared to Solomon at least three times and said basically that very same thing. And it wasn't very long. If you keep reading there in 1 Kings chapter 6, maybe chapter 7 or 8, he's, he's made, league, made affinity with Pharaoh and basically marries his daughter, which was a transgression of the law. Didn't take him very long before he started having his issues. Anyways, David received the pattern from the Lord and wrote it down, 1 Chronicles chapter 28, verses 12 and 19. And then he gives the plans to Solomon, as we read about in 1 Chronicles 28. So Moses was given plans to the tabernacle, and then David was given plans for the temple. And they were, they were given very, very precise measurements, and everything had to be done exactly thus and so. It had to be precisely just exactly the way God said for it to be in order to be the temple, the tabernacle, and then the temple in which God would dwell amongst his people. Uh, the ark, the, uh, the ark, the Noah's ark had to be built precisely so or it wouldn't float. It had to be just the way, exactly the way God said he wanted it or it wouldn't work. I think that's crucial for us to know that. All the sacrifices, you look at all the sacrifices in the first number of chapters of Leviticus, where they're all being described and what they're for and how they're to be offered, all those things were very, very precise. When you look at how the tabernacle and all of its instrumentation was being put together, even the incense was, was very, very specific, had very, very precise measurements, and could only be used for particular things. And you, you know, like you ladies couldn't use the same incense as perfume. Uh, the only proper use for the incense was in worship to God. All of these things are lessons for us. When God says, this is what I want, he really shouldn't need to, to repeat himself. This is what I want. Use it this way. I want you to do this, that, that. Very, very precise. And anything more or less is not what he wants. Now Solomon then built the temple, caused the ark to be brought up and placed in the most holy place, 1 Corinthians 8 and verse, Kings 8 and verse 2, after which the glory of the Lord filled the place, conferring his blessings and approval, as you read about in 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 6 to 11. By the way, as I'm thinking about it, a number of years back I started tracing the ark as it went through its various travels and where it was placed. That's, that's an interesting thing to do. And the last account we have of it is being placed in the, in the temple, and in Solomon's temple. That's the last real account I have of it being moved and, and so forth. Um, and that's, an, that's just, just an interesting thing I did a number of years back. But Solomon built according to plan, and God blessed him as a consequence Solomon was told to do, do it this way, Solomon did it that way, and then God blessed him. If you keep reading in 1 Kings, then over in the, in the, in the first, first Chronicles, it's amazing how much came to that man. The, 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 the amount of gold that came in on a regular basis. They had so much gold that silver just didn't amount to anything anymore. I can't imagine that. But nonetheless, that's the way it was. So just as Moses had a pattern, as did Solomon, we have a pattern to follow today. And, and I, for the life of me, don't understand why people don't grasp this point. That just as they were to, to build things precisely the way they were supposed to build it and use it precisely as they were to use it, that suddenly today we have, for, for whatever reason, 
We can just pretty much do whatever we want to do, and as long as our heart is right, God will accept what we do. Now, that's beyond me. If you, what matter of fact, if you read um, um, the book of, um, of Malachi, the people were given a hard time because they were bringing for an animal for an offering that they wouldn't present to the king as a gift because it was marred in some fashion. Broken, broken leg, got scuffed for you know bad eyes. Something, something that it was not the blue ribbon, four uh, H competitor kind of a thing. So Jesus is the rock upon which we build. Matthew sixteen. It's under. It's necessary for us to understand this. Jesus said, "I say unto you, thou art Peter." After God, Christ has said, "Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am?" And of course, they gave various things. And Jesus said, "But who do you say that I am?" And Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Thou art Peter, and upon this rock, his confession of who Jesus was, not necessarily his confession, but the fact of who Jesus was that Peter acknowledged. It's not his acknowledgement that it's built on. It's the fact that he was acknowledging in his confession that we're built on. Big, big, huge difference. And upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. But, you know, death. And I will give unto thee the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, the, the original language would read this way. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall have been bound already in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall have been loosed already in heaven. That's the way it should read. If I can, Jeannie, I can go get you my literal translation and you can read it for your little self and you can see that's exactly how. It, so what he's telling us there is that it's already been loosed. And by the way, Gary, I'm going to tell you about it now and then you can tell everybody else. That's, that's the language. That's the language. You can accept it or not. That's, that's up to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 5 through 15 says this. Uh, make sure I got this right passage. I did it again this morning to myself. Um, who then is Paul and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? I have planted, planted, Paulus watered, God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. For he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God, Ye are God's husbandry, ye, ye are God's building, according to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, which is Jesus Christ, and another buildeth thereon, which is Apollos, but let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon, for other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So, and we'll look at what that means here in just a little bit also. So Jesus being the Messiah is the foundational beginning of all of this. If you go back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, uh, Satan is told that the seed of the woman is going to bruise your head, crush your head, but you will bruise his heel. He's going to give you a death blow. We talked about that this morning. Deuteronomy 18 and verse 15, Moses said that God would raise up a prophet from among your own selves whom ye shall hear, and if you don't hear him, you want to be cut off from the people. In John 1 and verse 29, John the baptizer said, See, the seeing Jesus come, behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. Now, in Acts chapter 3, verse 22, that should be 22 verse through 26. Mark that as 22 through 26. Peter is citing Deuteronomy 18, 15 and is applying that to Jesus. So Moses said a prophet's going to come Peter said, Jesus is that prophet whom people shall hear. And if people won't listen to that prophet, they're going to be cut off. Now, in Ephesians 2 and verse 20, 
Paul says, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. He's not merely just the foundation. He is the cornerstone, which is in building is a very, very precisely cut block that is placed in the corner of the foundation, and everything is measured off of that. That would be your beginning point for everything else. So all the measurements would be taken off of that, the distance from there to that corner, that corner, and so forth. All of that comes off of that one, that one precisely cut block of, of stone, as it were. So that being the case, and it is, and we build upon Jesus, and we do, and if we're going to be co build correctly, we're going to do it as he says, then following his word is a very wise course of action. Because Jesus himself said, the words that I've spoken, the same shall judge you in the last day, John 12 and verse 48. So why wouldn't I want to do exactly and precisely as Jesus says to do anything whatsoever you do in word or in deed? Do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God and the Father by him, Colossians 3 and verse 17. So how is it then that I can just have any kind of a doctrine for what must I do to be saved? How is it then that I can just do anything I feel like doing in a worship assembly? How can I, how can I call myself by any other name other than what has been authorized by scriptures? How can I do that? Well, I mean, you can do anything that's subject to power, but that doesn't mean you're doing it by authority. I sure can do any, I can get a ball bat and just start hitting people with it. Why shouldn't you, well, that, you shouldn't be doing it. Well, why? Who said well, that's against the law. Well, I don't care. I feel it makes me feel good to hit people with a bit. Well, that's crazy. That's, we, we would no more do that, I mean, right thinking people, but yet we'll come and worship God just any old way we want to do, however we want to do it, whenever we choose to. And that's okay because my heart is right with God, people say. Well, that's just wrong. I'm not saying that's not what they feel. That's what they feel. They tell you what they feel. I'm saying their feelings are mis, mis, misguided. Because if I were back in the old days of Moses and I didn't bring the right sacrifice for a particular sin, that sin wouldn't be forgiven. If I were to bring a, 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 a lamb to be sacrificed and it was blind in one eye or it was crippled in some form or fashion or another, then normally at birth you might say, well, that's a runner or whatever, we're going to have to kill it because we don't want it to breed. I know, let's just, just raise it up and we'll, we'll take it down there to the temple. We'll take it down to the temple and sacrifice it for ourselves. No, oh no, oh no. That would not be acceptable. That would not be acceptable. But yet, today we can do whatever we want. We have instructions how one becomes a church member. How and when to worship. How a congregation is to govern itself. And all these other, we have, we have precise scriptures, book chapters and verses that tells us how these things are done. We know who are to be the elders of a, of a con and pastors and bishops of a congregation. We know what their qualifications are supposed to be. But yet just anybody can be, <laughs> it confuses people. Oh, you're a pastor. No, I'm not a pastor. I was in a Bible bookstore. I was going to school of preaching. I was in a Bible bookstore. I needed to get me a good study Bible. It, my first Thompson chain reference. And I was looking at certain passages standing up next to the counter. I asked a young lady, you know, I need a good study Bible, and she said, Thompson Chain Reference. So I'm looking at it, and I'm looking at various passages and seeing what the, what the center, col well, not center column references, but the chain references are. And, and I didn't really say anything besides that. And she said, oh, you're a pastor. No, I'm not old enough. What? I said, besides that, I don't have any children, much less believing children. She said, what? Yeah, 1 Timothy chapter 3. You never, well, I knew. So we opened up 1 Timothy chapter 3 and had a little Bible study. I never saw that before. Well, look at Titus chapter 1, verse 5. <gasps> well, I never knew that. Good thing I showed up for Bible today, isn't it? So, things like that, um, that people just have never, they, they have never heard that. Um, when I preached that uh, funeral up there for Mike Joel's dad a couple weeks back, uh, a woman came up to me and she says, uh, you use a lot of scriptures, don't you? <laughs> I said, yeah. She said, I've just never heard preaching like that before. What do you listen to? I, I'm, I'm serious. People say that to me. And I, well, what have you been listening to? Maybe you should come down over here if you want some more of it. Anyways, second place, service in and to the church 
always, or rather also requires sanctification for all that is used. Now again, going back to the tabernacle, to the temple. If you go back and look at, at the, everything in the tabernacle service was sprinkled with blood. When Moses had, had uh, gathered everything that was, that was manufactured for the tabernacle and raised up the tabernacle, covered everything over, put all the instruments of all the implements and instruments into the tabernacle where they belong. He sprinkled everything with blood. He sprinkled all the people with blood. And he sprinkled the, the, the law with blood. And then, if you keep on reading, see, Exodus, Exodus ends and Leviticus begins, but it's still the same process. If you read through about Leviticus chapter 8, you're still seeing the process of the sanctification being done. You get, to, you get the particulars of all the sacrifices. And then, he get, about chapter 7 and 8, I think it is, of Leviticus, he gathers together Aaron and his sons, gets them all dressed up, anoints them, and, and sprinkles blood on them. Nothing. Zero. Nothing that was not first sanctified, nothing that had not yet been sanctified could be or was used in tabernacle service without serious consequences. You go back and look at it. Very, very particular in what they were doing. Very, very particular in what they were doing. In Leviticus chapter 10, when Nadab and Abihu offered strange fire, and fire came out from the Lord and burned them up, Moses told Aaron, don't you come out of the tabernacle. You've been sanctified and more than your son. And by the way, you best not cry either. What? Yes, they were, if, he left the, if he left the tabernacle being sanctified, bad things would happen to him. Couldn't even cry. Don't even cry. How do you, I don't know how you do that. I I don't know. It, it, it'd just be all over with, I think, at that point. I'm, I'm, I don't know. I don't know how you do that. But he was told. That's what he was told. And he obeyed it. So anyways, I've got it all listed down there for you. You can go to, back and take a look at that and study it for yourself and see how... Now here, and again, again, granted, the laws have changed. Governing worship has changed. But where does the idea come from that we are now just free to do whatever we want to do, however we choose to do it. Where does that come from? And frankly, I don't know. I'm at, I, that just stymies me. The church is the same way. Now, we don't have the time to read all these verses I've got down there. I've got listed, but they all talk about how, how the church is sanctified. So there's nothing used in worship, assembly, or service to God that has not been sanctified first by the blood of the Lamb. I'd be interested, in, if you find something, I'd be interested in seeing, interested in seeing the passages you use. But in, in uh, Hebrews chapter 10, got some verses here, ver, uh, verse 9 beginning. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, the law, law of Moses, that he may establish the second, the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Verse 10 says, by the which will, we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Verse 14 says, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Verse 22 says, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, Having, and I speak in the Jews now, having our hearts sprinkled, uh, Jewish Christians, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. Now, the, the Jew understood sprinkling as sanctification. Now, he's not saying that we're sprinkled today for sanctification in the same way, but he's using that word picture. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. The only instrument authorized for use and, and worship assemblies amongst God's faithful people today is the heart because it's the only instrument that has been sprinkled with the blood of the Lamb. Why don't we have a mechanical instrument of music? If you show me the one that's been sprinkled with the blood of the Lamb, we'll use it. But you can't do it. That blood's been taken to heaven and offered in heaven. 
There is no blood today to sprinkle a Steinway piano or, or a, a Gibson bass guitar or I don't even know what, who manufactures drum kits and all the rest. I don't, have no idea. You, it's not, you can't use it because it's not been sprinkled. It's not been sanctified. If it has been, by whom and when and how and with what? You can't do it. It's not possible. And anybody says they've done it, they're, they're just stretching the truth. I won't call them liars, but they're stretching the truth. We'll leave it at that. And then chapter 13 and verse 12, 13, 12 says, Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Anything sanctified with the blood of the Lamb is sanctified with the blood that was shed outside the gate. Revelation 1 and verse 5. Jesus washes us from our sin in his blood. Revelation 7, 14, the angel says to John in the vision, he's seen, a, he's seen a mass of people in white robes, white linen robes. And the, the angel says, who are these folks? And John says, thou knowest. The man says, these are they that have come out of tribulation and washed. They have washed their robes in the blood of the lamb. But Revelation 1, 5 says that Jesus does it. Revelation 7, 14 say they did it. It is a mutual operation. It's done. When I do it, Jesus is doing. What Jesus is doing, is doing it, I'm doing it. It's a mutual, simultaneous operation. We are submitting to the will of God. I am being obedient, bowing my knee, confessing with my tongue, and we're both washing me in his blood at the same time. I am participating in that process. And then finally, Ephesians chapter 5. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also led the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy without blemish, that our robes are white and clean in the blood of the Lamb, because he and we washed us together at the same time. Nothing else can be used in service to God. Nobody else can serve God until they've been sanctified. Now, can they go through the motions? Oh, sure. I, I, yes, absolutely. But that doesn't mean they're doing anything God wants them to do. God wants them to do it right. But doesn't God want me to be happy? Absolutely. But he wants you to be happy within the boundaries of what he's told you to be. I've got a sermon. I, think, I don't think I've preached that here yet. I have to pull it out and preach it. And we know precisely when the sanctification happens. And here's, here's a question you need to ask your religious friends, neighbors, and relatives. What is it that washes our sins away? A lot of them can tell you. When does the blood of the Lamb wash our sins away? When are your sins forgiven? Book, chapter, and verse tells, tell me when. Quote, find me a book, chapter, and verse that tells me when our sins are forgiven. Not the what. The what we already established the what is the blood of the Lamb. It's the when that's the crucial part. Acts 22, 16, Ananias came to, to Paul and said, uh, Saul of Tarsus was, when Saul of Tarsus was in emotional distress in Damascus, and he said, And now, why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized, and do what? Wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Ah, you folks believe in water salvation. No, as a matter of fact, we don't. We believe in sanctification by the blood of the Lamb. But this tells us when the what does, does its job. The what is the blood, the when is when we're baptized in order to obtain the remission of sins. Not because of the water, it's because of the blood we come in contact with, spiritually speaking, while we're in the water. There's no other passage in the Bible. Now let me, it might be Galatians chapter 3, 26 and following, that tells me when my sins are washed away. Now not, not the what, the what is the blood. When is the blood applied to the heart? And we're baptized for remission of sins in order to obtain unto, toward, the remission of sins. Romans chapter 6, 16 through 18. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin and the death, of obedience unto righteousness? But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you, being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. When am I, and I, I've had my friends, the folks I've been studying with, I said, read this out loud to me. And they do, from their own Bibles, by the way. When 
do we become servants of righteousness? When do we obey from the heart the form of doctrine? Which, when is that? Well, we're made free when we obey from the heart the form of doctrine delivered. Well, what's the form of the doctrine? Go back to verses 3 and 4 and have them read that out loud to you again. That's when. That's the form of doctrine. The doctrine, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, if you're taking notes, write that, that down. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, the gospel's death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. You can't, you can't obey a, a fact. You can obey a command that represents the fact. Baptized for the remission of sins, 1 Corinthians or Romans 16, 6, verses 3 and 4. That's what does it. And then 1 Peter 1, 22 and 23 Seeing you have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit. It almost sounds like the same thing, doesn't it? I know unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. How do you know you're supposed to do that? The word of God tells me what to do. How did, how did Moses know what to do? God told him. How did, uh, how did Solomon know what to do? David wrote it down and gave it to him. Here's his instructions. Follow it. Made a meatloaf this morning according to instructions. I followed it. Get out this, this, and this, and mix them all together, and it's 350 for an hour and a half, and there you go. That's how it works. Follow the instructions. We, the church and its members, make up God's temple. You and I are the stones in the house of God built upon the foundation of Christ. And it's in that spiritual structure that God dwells. The Bible says that. I, you just go by what the Bible says. We, we by, by virtue of being sanctified, we're God's temple. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 16, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. That's huge. That is, that is galactically huge. God indwells the church. You and I are lively stones built up in that church upon the foundation of Christ. God and the Spirit dwells in that structure. How does he do that? I don't care. I, I really don't. I'm, I'm just glad that he does. I'm glad I'm part of that process. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. What? Know ye not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and you're not your own? Again, I, I'm, not, I'm not interested. Well, I'm interested in how, it does, how that works, but really... And until God tells me, well, there's no book, chapter, and verse that tells me exactly how he does that. I don't know how my own spirit indwells me. I know that it does I'm because I'm animated. Okay? And so are we by the spirit, by the love, joy, peace, and so forth. We are the house of God as prophesied. It's a matter of prophecy. Paul said in 1 Timothy 3, 15, But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself, and the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth. The house of God is a prophetic term uttered by Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Let us go up to the house of the God of Jacob. Beloved, we're that house. By prophetic utterance and prophetic fulfillment, that's it. We are it. We are that house. And we're told how to behave in it. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 6, but Christ has a son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. That's ungetoverable. That's just, and, and then, then how people claim to be members of the church behave the way they do. Now, notice something else about all this. I don't, you know, again, I'm not sure how all this works. I'm just glad that it does. But not only are we lively stones built up into the house, but we are the priesthood that serves within that tabernacle, within that building, within that, 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 that edifice. Again, looking at 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 5 through 10, he says, Ye also as lively stones, lively stones, are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. So that means we have to be sanctified all the time. We're not in a course that shows up once every 12 months and serves our course for 30 days, then we go home. 
Let me answer it. They won't call again. <laughs> Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praise of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, you were Gentiles but are now the people of God which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. I think that's a citation, I believe, from the book of Hosea. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus informs me of the pattern to follow in becoming a Christian, worshiping God acceptably, reforming my life in all areas. It is an absolute guide that when followed exactly and precisely, affords us an entrance into heaven. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 11. 1 Peter. If it's not 1 Peter, look at 2 Peter. Okay, excuse me for that. It is in this process that we are built up a spiritual house in which God can dwell with his people. Exodus 25, 8 and 9. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. A very, very precisely constructed edifice. Very, very precisely constructed and very, very precisely used. According to all that I show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so ye shall ye make it. 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 16. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And it's all based upon our sanctification. It's all based upon our, our willingness to, to uh, uh, be sanctified, to then continue to engage in the practice of being a sanctified priesthood. And going forward, when we've done all those things, we'll have found ourselves in heaven. Now I'm amazed at how people can hear that and then just go do whatever it is they want to do in the rest of their lives. I hear people that claim, to, that claim the Lord Jesus is my personal Savior. Well, he is a personal Savior. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, so forth. Christ liveth in me in life which I live, live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me, loved me and gave himself for me. That's, personal. That's about as personal as you can get. But then they make that claim and then just go do whatever it is they want to do. Say whatever it is they want to say. Go, go engage in any activity at any place with any people at any time. And not show up for worship assemblies and Bible studies and, and church activities. That's beyond me. And on the day of judgment, they're going to be surprised. And I don't know what to say about that other than repent. And they look at you like there's something wrong with you when you say that to them. But... On the other hand, people want to go to heaven. They won't have an argument with this. The only discussion will be is, well, how do we make sure we're doing this right and, and make sure that everything we do is correct? Well, what did they do back then? They got out the law, the scrolls. They opened up the scrolls and looked at them. The folks in Thessalonica did that. They opened up the scrolls and said whether these things were so. Whatever Paul was saying, let's just double check this. I don't have a problem with somebody double checking my outlines. Matter of fact, that's why I hand them out so people can mainly so you can follow and keep up but, but, because we go so quick sometimes but to look at that stuff and study it out for yourself I want that to be out in your hands I want people to study what the scriptures say don't take my word for it look it up yourselves if you're not a child of God become one Jesus said he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved That's the Lord said the Lord said we have to hear the truth John 6 44 and 45 we have to believe that Jesus is Christ John 8 verse 24 Jesus said uh, we have to be willing to repent of our sins, Luke 13 and verse 3. Jesus said we then have to confess him, Matthew 10, 32 and 33, confess him before men. We have to be baptized for mission of our sins, Mark 16, 16. Live that faithful Christian life to gain heaven, Revelation 2 and verse 10. All those are said by Jesus. If we do that, 
that we will be those whom Jesus adds to the church, Acts 2 and verse 47. The Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved. If you've done those things, you've become unfaithful. Ask God's forgiveness. He's promised to forgive you, 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, 8, and 9, and, and restore you once again to faithful service in His, in his service, in His kingdom. If you need prayers, let's pray together. Bible study, let's open up our Bibles. But don't let anything keep you from the road to heaven. We invite you to come while together we stand and as we sing.